Leave it then. Yeah, oh, you're gonna be in the video with me now? Yeah. Hey everybody, we're back here with our third episode of the vlog for the K2N Online Paddle School, and we are here in a new house. We have just moved. Uh, we're still in the Hernando area here in Citrus County, Florida, and uh, have a new filming studio here. So uh, we're still getting that all set up. Should still have a video coming out this Friday uh, on surf ski remounts is on the schedule for this week. This week's vlog is just going over some more training. This week I'm gonna be in the outrigger canoe doing some drills, going through a workout. My GoPro was functioning the entire time. There was no user error this time. So I have a bit more of the actual training footage there. Last week I went over the outrigger remounting technique after a hooli. The video solely is on physically how to grab, hold, and use your body to get back into the vessel efficiently. And that didn't go over every aspect of safety, so we will have a follow-up video going over that. A common response to Huli recovery is always, it doesn't count if. Typically, it doesn't count if you're not in high wind situations in the ocean, but I was posed with an interesting scenario. Scenario is the athlete is completely exhausted, they flip their vessel, they're in the water, and the remount procedure is now going to change based on their exhaustion levels. One of the entire reasons in having a procedure and a systematic approach to doing something is identifying what is the most efficient way. Once you have outlined the most efficient way, in this case, getting back into the canoe, changing those parameters can only lead you astray in becoming less efficient. When the conditions get turbulent or difficult or you add in fatigue, if you have to change the methodology, you are either finding something more efficient, which should be your systematic approach to begin with, or you're becoming less efficient. So at the end of the workout, I am totally exhausted and I challenge myself, I flip the boat and I wanted to see what would be the difference in going through the recovery process while being fatigued. So stay tuned to the end of the episode to see how I deal with that. That will also be covered in the follow-up to the Huli recovery, going over every conceivable safety factor of getting back in your boat, identifying your surroundings, and keeping you all safe on the water. Thank you guys so much for checking it out, and I hope you enjoy the training footage. All right, we're back to sunny Florida, Hernando Lake. It is eight in the morning and it is super hot. Anytime I get into an outward canoe, the first thing I do is fly the Yama and try to paddle a little bit with it up. This helps me orient how I'm going to sit in the boat, gives me a feel for the canoe, gives me a gauge of my nervous system if I'm able to adequately balance the boat that I'm using that day. And uh, overall, it's just a good way to just kind of fine tune, wake up your body and uh, become one with the boat, right? Feeling your vessel, situating yourself properly in it. It's a simple little drill. If you can build on it and expand, it shows a mastery of your balance, control, and comfort within the canoe. So I take a bunch of strokes here. Next one I'm paddling on the left side, I try to flick the ama up when I'm normally paddling. I don't do this so aggressively, but this is another way to just make sure that the hips are firing, keeping the ama light on left side strokes. Again, it's another skill, very easy to develop. If you're watching me paddle there, it looks like normal paddle strokes, but the weight shift with the hip thrust is making the ama super light. It's another fine tuned motion. First thing here is a catch drill. Uh, the workout today is a very high stroke rate focused workout. And so I want to feel this connection with the front of the stroke. I'm only doing the front of the stroke. But just feeling the blade tip touching the water and making that contact with the water. Waiting until the whole blade is in the water is the entirety of this stroke, right? So if you're waiting to put pressure on your blade when the whole blade's in the water, there's a lot of that stroke that's very valuable that you are missing. You can see the moment my blade tip touches the water, I'm making contact and the boat is moving here pretty efficiently just from putting the blade in the water. So this catch drill is a great way to find and feel that connection with the water. The next one here is going to be the one, two, three. So one, I load the leg, turning the hips two, set up the paddle blade, positive blade angle, and three, taking the stroke. So there's one, two, and three. One, two, and three. The main thing here is activating the legs and the hips. You can see how far forward my left knee is here as I'm setting up on the, the one aspect of the one, two, three. 
As the stroke rate climbs in the bulk of the exercise or the workout here, it's very tough to move the larger joints, right? So moving the legs, moving the hip, a lot of times that falls to the wayside, right? So this drill is just to wake up that part of the body because we're gonna be relying on it a lot during the actual workout. One, two, and three. It's a very simple drill, just little dramatic pauses between each segment. The next one here is switches. Again, as the stroke rate climbs, the switches are gonna have to get faster and faster. The main thing I'm doing here is I'm making sure that I'm switching the paddle without moving my hips and legs. As you are at the exit of one stroke, you are perfectly set up for the catch on the opposite side. So all you wanna do is freeze frame your hips and legs and then throw the paddle to the other side like so. This is a great thing to practice on land just in case you throw your paddle and you're still kind of learning the hand finesse here. I had somebody recently asked me, Robert, did you for real go eight miles per hour paddling one side and one stroke at a time? So here I start to increase the speed and as we go further along, I turn on the speedometer to try and confirm if I'm able to still hit eight miles per hour on a consistent basis. So right here in the high sevens, and I'll get one stroke here, I think that's gonna be over eight. The faster it is, you can see even I fumble the paddle every now and then. But right there, there's that eight miles an hour, one stroke at a time. It takes a lot of effort to do that. So the workout today is 40 strokes per minute for one minute, 50 strokes per minute for a minute, 60, 70, and then one minute of recovery and then restarting up the pyramid. So right here, this is 40 strokes per minute. It's actually like 36 to 38. I keep looking at my watch. The super low stroke rates are tough for me to get a feel for because I just don't paddle at 40 strokes per minute often enough to get a good feel for it. I'm usually 45, 50 uh, in low training zones. So the boat speed is the main thing that we're trying to lock on to. We want to make sure that even at a low stroke rate, we're creating the glide and connection with the water. So the speedometer there shows that being in the high sixes, low sevens at a low stroke rate means that that connection is adequate with the water. So here we go. We're starting to increase to 50 strokes per minute. The only thing that really changes is the recovery during 40, 50, and even 60. That length in the water is able to stay together. And you can see the stroke rate now, high seven to eight. So that extra 10 strokes per minute really does start to add up. As we get to 70 strokes per minute and beyond, the stroke length has to shorten because there's just not enough time to take this same long stroke. So this is where you get diminishing returns on very high stroke rates because you have to cheat in some way and removing the blade sooner is that methodology to cheat. So right here, we're starting to creep up in the 50s and this should be 60 strokes per minute here. So it's about one stroke every second that we're looking for. And as we're going through the movement, trying to take that full stroke and be quick on the recovery to the next stroke. If there is an aspect of the stroke that you do want to remove to try and get a higher stroke rate, the exit and when you leave the water is that part that you want to remove, right? You don't really want to remove the front half of your stroke because there's a lot of leverages. Again, it's all diminishing returns though. It is not sustainable sitting at 70 strokes per minute for any meaningful amount of time. So you have to be very careful with getting as much as you can out of the stroke getting as much glide out of your vessel as you can and utilizing your tool to its maximum. So this drill is a great way to kind of go through a bunch of different methodology in moving a canoe quickly and seeing what ends up working for you. 60 and 70 strokes per minute should be closer to like a full effort more so than the 40 and 50 should be much more sustainable. So right here, the stroke rate is starting to climb, moving the hips, moving the legs, positive blade angle, all those drills that we did beforehand, trying to keep all of these skills together, the quick switches. It's great doing drills before you go and do your real workout, making sure that the movement all stays intact. The thing that's really moving your canoe is your body and your leverage, right? So the moment that those begin to deteriorate, your boat and your boat speed is also going to diminish. So this is definitely 70 strokes per minute. So we got one stroke every, what, 0.8 seconds, 0.9 seconds approximately. And you can see the boat speed doesn't just fly to like eight, nine, 10 miles an hour, right? 
So the shorter stroke, you can see my top hand doesn't go as far down or removing the blade a little bit sooner. So turning over quicker comes at the cost of a shorter stroke in the water and the boat speed proportionally doesn't follow it up, right? If I could take that full stroke and turn over at 70 or 80 strokes per minute, the boat speed would be like nine or 10 miles an hour, which just isn't sustainable. And then that's the end of that minute. And then we got super easy. You can see the boat speed start to drop, trying to catch my breath, thinking about the next set, moving the hip, moving the leg, going through the motion, still trying to hold on to technique, even as you're exhausted during these recovery sets. This is the most important time to make sure that you have proper movement throughout your sprint. So the next clip is the final minute, which is a full sprint. And this final minute, is going to be where I hooli at the end and go over that remounting procedure while being dead tight. All right, here we go. This is the final set, 70 strokes per minute. I gave it a little extra juice on this last one. I was able to sustain over eight miles an hour the whole way, most of it at least. So you can see the stroke is super short. Top hand doesn't go very far. The finesse of turning over quickly is getting the stroke rate up. I think this is way beyond 70 strokes per minute, actually watching it back. Uh, this is the last set, so I wanted to give it a good good amount of juice here. The so sustaining eight miles an hour for this minute is, uh, that's not bad. Uh, I ended up doing about uh, 45 minutes worth of the drills or the, uh, the workout today. So I did like five sets. So going through. All right, dead tired, hit it, boom. So people ask, Robert, why don't you have a, a personal flotation device? And in my mind, especially on the flat water lake here, right, assessing the surroundings, I have a 20 foot flotation device. When I fall out of a boat, that is my flotation device. If I am not incapacitated, my ability to grab the vessel is the flotation device. So the first thing I do here when I'm tired is I go over to the AMA, I throw my arm over it, and I just hang out until I catch my breath. Then I go under and begin the remounting process. Being comfortable in the water, knowing the limitations and how you can use your tool to your advantage is the key to staying safe. If you are still conscious, you have the ability to lean on your boat to catch your breath. So there's no way that you could be too tired to be unable to get back in the boat. Then the remount procedure is the exact same. Once you catch your breath, grab the sides, pull yourself in. You can see I'm still catching my breath, giving the shaka to the camera there. So after the huli and the remount, just goofing around here, I wanted to see if I could make these turns around these buoys with the ama up. Drills that challenge your balance and confidence in a canoe only enhance your ability to move, right? Having an extreme level of comfort in the boat is the key to staying safe, to applying power. There are so many good things that come from just goofing around and just flying the Yama in the air. The next one here is with the Yama up making a left-hand turn. There's a boat coming over to this buoy, so I have to kind of strategize how I'm going to go around him. And it's just like with the remount process. If you are comfortable with the water, you are comfortable with the canoe, you are comfortable with your skills, your safety goes way up. If you have any doubts in any of those regards, it can only hinder your overall safety out on the water. So again, Lake Hernando is super safe and I wouldn't do half these things that if I was in nine foot ocean swells, but again, assess your surroundings and get the most out of your situation. The last thing I wanna to do to goof off here is see if I can hit a top speed. I've never hit 10 miles an hour in an outrigger canoe. And so I, every time I'm in the boat, I always try to see if I can, can do it. And I can't. I get to nine here and there. And I get, you know, nine is fast. But for me, personal goals wise, I would love to hit 10. Some of the guys that are like the fastest on the planet can hold 10. And I can't even touch it for a second. It was only like 20 or 30 strokes. And I'm like, I'm whipped. So that is it for the workout today. Coming through, picking up the boat, walking up with the boat. Thank you guys so much for joining us here on Lake Hernando, and we'll see you in a couple weeks for the next vlog. Big shout out to all of our YouTube members, as well as everybody subscribed to the K2OnlinePaddleSchool.com. If you'd like me to write you some training plans that are very similar to the workout that you saw here today, don't forget to go onto the website, 
Check it out, and I can be your personal coach.